Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the Super Show podcast, episode number 203. I'm your host for this week, Jamie, and I am joined by a man who, um, I have it on good authority, is about to spend his entire weekend dogging, um, which I also have on good authority, is just a code name for playing Dragon's Dogma 2. It's Mr. Alex Jones. How are you, sir? <laughs> I love that. Imagine that that gets re reframed, uh, co-opted, the word dogging, to mean playing Dragon's Dogma 2. Uh, okay. I don't know if I've had an aneurysm or something, but I keep seeing Dragon's Dogma 2 stuff and I I keep thinking I want to play it. But then I listen to people talk about the game and I don't know what they're talking about. So I'm like, maybe I shouldn't? (laughs) Yeah, I've kind of experienced the same thing. It's especially confusing when you carve out a place in your mind for the original game as this kind of this niche thing that... Let, let's be, I don't want to offend anyone inside the first minute of a podcast, but it was kind of played by weirdos, and those weirdos spent yeah. a long time talking about their weird love and obsession with the game. And as we've talked about this phenomenon multiple, multiple times over the, the course of this podcast, but sometimes in the, the hype cycle for a forthcoming sequel, a game goes from obscure and niche and cult to being the most unbelievably mainstream, you've got to play it or you're a fucking weirdo series on the planet. Like, I like I don't know. We talked about Animal Crossing. We talked about Baldur's Gate. Sometimes series just go from being like not even necessarily niche, just a little bit kind of like I don't know, tucked to one side, to being the most mainstream things going. And it's it's hard to keep up. It is, and I, I think no, in no small part that it's it's the technology these days allows games that that were already a concept already existed to really like come into their own and i think dragon's dogma 2 like if you look at that game it looks gorgeous and it just looks and you can and you get it you get it more than it's 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 a lot easier to get a game like that i think when it looks fantastic and you really see what they're trying to get at as opposed to like a bit of a a ropey graphics job bit too you know you've got to put you've got to put more of yourself into it to have the full enjoyment like i i think that's the yes. that's true of even games like hell divers 2 i think it's true of that like you could that game has now got the ability to be what it probably always wanted to be um but yeah it, lo- it looks fantastic so um i may well uh, yeah. become become a dogger we'll find out i look forward to hear about your adventures in dogging and, and all the pawns that you clamber all over um again these are these are terms that are relatively new to me but as we uh, too, walk yeah. <laughs> Head first into this brave new Dragon's Dogma flavored future of ours. Um, I think we're all just going to have to get used to it. Um, I, I, but you know what? Jonesy, spoil. Like, I talked in previous episodes about how this week might come down to a kind of a tete a tete between uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 and, and Rise of the Ronin. It does, based on the uh, critics' embargoes that have dropped uh, in the last sort of 48 hours for each of those games, seem as though there may be a clear winner. So. Um, yeah, yes. yeah. It looks like we may have been unfortunately correct about our fears around Rise of the Ronin, um, but we'll have to wait to sort of really get a good feel for it. But yeah, and Dragon, we hey, we've been told multiple times by our lovely patrons that uh, oh, yes. Dragon's Dogma Two is going to be a hell of a game. So uh, we were relying on what they've said, and it sounds like they were right. So yeah, there you go. There are so, there are some people on the Discord that are so desperate for us to. At the very least, I think play Dragon's Dogma two. That at times it's almost as though I'm I'm awaiting a DM where they're like, I've just bought it, for, just I've bought it for you. You don't need to think about <laughs> it. Just go away and, and, and play it. Um, not quite in that seed of thought in anyone's mind. This isn't some weird like you know conspiracy psyop thing. Don't worry about it. Um, but for now, as Jonesy and I have played neither Dragon's Dogma two or Rise of the Ronin because we're not cool avant garde in the no games journalist types. No. Um, we're just going to have to bring you the boring old news, which fortunately for this week isn't all that boring. There is some meat on the bone, and we're going to get into a couple of discussions, at least one of which, Jonesy, I know you're going to offer up all kinds of an opinions that <laughs> some people are going to reluctantly agree with because whether they like it or not, it's inevitable, and other people are going to get furiously angry at. That is on the topic of AI because Ubisoft have been showing off some very interesting shall we say um workings at gdc but we're also going to be touching on another thing that happened at gdc that is the state of unreal that epic put on which of course debuted a new marvel game which has been capturing the attention of some of the internet but before all of that jonesy we're going to be talking about the playstation 5 pro and for anyone that has read the title of this podcast and or maybe even seen the thumbnail of the youtube video of this podcast you'll know that we'll be coming at it with a bit of an angle um because 
the thing that's leaked isn't, of course, the existence of the PlayStation 5 Pro, which has been something of an open secret for a little while now. It's not even the release window of the PlayStation 5 Pro, which we've expected to be this this fall, as our American brethren would call it, uh, for some time now. It's actually the specs. And whilst Jonesy and I will be sharing, you know, the the changes on the GPU and the CPU side, and we will be uh, saying things like teraflops and gigahertz, <laughs> and some of you will be scratching your heads and others of you will be nodding, um, we'll be doing a mix of both, I think. Uh, we're coming at it from a bit of a perspective of kind of, um, put put simply, who is this for and why does this feel like this is coming at like the most bizarre time uh, possible? Uh, again, semantics, but we'll get into that. And if you want to get involved in the conversation at any point, I'll remind you that you can do exactly that. We are, of course, live on YouTube. There may, there may indeed be some of you already in the chat chiming in, uh, in, in which case, hello. Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you here. But of course, you can watch us on YouTube after the fact. You can leave a comment in the comment section down below. You can catch us on Twitter. The handle is at SuperShowPod. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, if you just want to listen to our voices, then the major podcasting platforms are at your disposal. Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. And of course, you can hear us beamed out on digital radio at paisleyradio.com. That's at Thursdays at 10 p.m. And with that, all to one side, Jonesy. First of all, do you have anyone you want to say hello to? Uh, we've got a couple of people. We've got the Funky Penguin and we've got Wesley who are hanging out right now in chat. So hello to you both. Thank you for joining us. Uh, do, do you know what? Every time there's someone who's with just a first name, in fact, there may well be a second name that you just haven't read, oh, but no, I'm going to take it as just Wesley. Okay. Because in my head, that was Wesley Snipes, who was just, he's at home. He has nothing better to do with his life right now. Not many jobs, you know, come, he's waiting for Demolition Man 2 to get greenlit. And in the meantime, he's just listening to the Super Show podcast. That would be pretty cool. He's sending groveling emails to Mahershala Ali saying, please let me cameo in the new Blade. Um, and Mahershala's writing back saying, sorry, Wes, it's just it's just not the look we're going for. Um, but he may, he, well, probably not, but he may be involved in the upcoming Blade video game, Jonesy, which is a game that some people are probably going to be playing on a PlayStation 5 Pro because that will presumably still be a somewhat relevant console by the time uh, that game comes out. Have you seen the apparent specs for this as yet unannounced and as yet unnamed PlayStation 5 professional console? I have not. All right. Then let me run you through the Cliff Notes version of it because, as I said, you can really get caught in the weeds with this stuff. And I advise anyone who wishes to do, even, to do so even more than we're about to, to head out online and to see all the various numbers and figures. But essentially some documentation. I think it's the documentation that is being sent to developers alongside things like dev kits. Uh, leaked online, initially appearing on YouTube, which led to some people saying, this seems like bullshit, I'm not going to buy into this. Um, but it was later verified and indeed uh, you know, further detailed by the likes of Insider Gaming, IGN, The Verge, and Digital Foundry. So this is uh, pretty much as close as it gets to being a, a done deal in terms of the, you know, the, how reliable these specs are, at least at the time of reporting, at the time of the documentation was made. Um, one of the big talking points which I'm going to see I'm going to plant now, but it's definitely going to be something we're going to have to break down, is that the PS5 Pro CPU will be identical to that of the standard PS5. Now, of course, where the bottleneck for the you know, current PlayStation 5 titles is varies from case to case, but there are already some examples of games where the CPU does appear to be the bottleneck. There are smarter people than us out there, like Digital Foundry, who have already had in-depth conversations about this subject, and that seems to be... Um, a topic of not necessarily controversy, but definitely a talking point. Now, we'll have a high CPU frequency mode, which increases the CPU by 10% to 3.85 gigahertz, but then reduces the GPU performance by around 1% as a result. However, on the flip side, the GPU is where the biggest gains will be found. Uh, it will be powered by 33.5 teraflops versus the PS5's 10.28 teraflops. We've heard in the past, of course, how teraflops isn't the most uh, useful way of uh, gauging just how powerful a console is, whether that's in sort of like, you know, comparative terms, looking at, for example, a PlayStation versus an Xbox, or in relative terms, and you know, a PlayStation versus a PlayStation in this case. Um, but it does seem like there is a big investment um, into the GPU side of things. Jonesy, I know it's so hard to look at numbers like these and, and stats like these and, and glean too much information, but if we looked at just the CPU and GPU part, and maybe if I also asked you in the broader terms, when you look at this and you look at the specs for the PS5 Pro, but also consider when it come, when it's coming out, not necessarily how many years we're into this generation, but if this makes sense, how many years it feels like we're into this generation, 
how many PS5, how long PS5s have been on store shelves and you could just pick them up and walk out the store, yep. the number of PS5 exclusives, all of these things. Does this feel weird or is it just me? It does feel weird. It feels like it's far too early in the life cycle and we're talking about a bunch of stuff that is, I, I'm like, is this, are these the things that we really are calling for when we're talking about um, hardware stuff like is it going to make much of a difference to my day to day like I don't know man it's hard to get excited about stuff like this but at the same time I'm not you know maybe I'm not the target audience for this which is weird because normally I would be like at this point in the life cycle I think I'd be ready to like hop in with a with a, a pro console a right. mid tier console but um, yeah it does feel a little odd yeah do you think then like if the software situation was slightly different, you'd be a bit more keen for it. Like if we went back to around the launch or of the PS4 Pro um, so in the previous generation, I remember that kind of launched more or less alongside the likes of Horizon Zero Dawn. But then, of course, 2017, 2018, you were talking about God of War. You were talking about Spider-Man. You were talking about Red Dead 2. You were talking about, I don't know, there were probably like, you know, some like... Uh, days gone was slightly further afield but maybe like detroit and you know just a few other there were games on your radar that you could look at the ps4 ps4 pro as a as a as a vessel for outside that, of gta 6 like wh what do you want a ps5 pro for at the moment that is exactly the point i think the ps4 pro you were you were sort of like knocking on the door of not being able to ha enjoy games as fully as you wanted to because you're being hindered by the hardware but yeah, the PlayStation Five just doesn't seem to be in the same place. So what? Yeah, what are you looking at? What games are you looking at that you you're eyeballing to you know get a better system, a faster system? I mean, the only thing I can think is that there's people out there who who are annoyed that the PlayStation Five itself hasn't lived up to the expectations, like a, a fixed 60 FPS on certain games and stuff like that, and having to like sacrifice um, ray tracing or resolution in order to get that higher frame rate. Um, but then realistically, are we saying actually they just didn't quite meet the mark with the PlayStation 5 originally? So that's what the PlayStation 5 Pro is doing, is picking yes. up some of that slack. Um, it's tricky. It is a, it is a tricky one. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I feel like we had a similar conversation going from the PS4 to the PS4 Pro to the P basically including these sort of half step console generations. We've always had the same thing, which is that how do you market this without? almost indirectly saying hey this is the console that really does the thing we promised the last one would do um and like when you look at some of what they're kind of they're targeting even internally at the moment it does kind of seem like we've looped back around to some of the promises and the pitches for the ps5 initially and we haven't really covered much ground um one of the things that Insider Gaming uh, detailed, which is sort of a relatively useful way of uh, figuring out what's being looked at at the moment, are two case studies for two unnamed first-party games. Uh, so game one, um, basically, they've outlined what you would get depending on what console you were playing on. So with game one, if you're playing on a standard PlayStation 5, you would get, and this will sound very familiar to most people already, a performance mode, which offered 1080p at 60 frames a second, or a fidelity mode, which went up, boosted it up to 8, 1800p at 30 frames a second. And there may well be, if that 1800p is native, there may well be some, you know, checkerboarding, upsampling solution to get, you know, technically 4K or whatever. If the PlayStation 5 Pro was inserted into that situation, the current look is that you would get you wouldn't get an option. You would get 1440p at 60 frames a second. So you would get the frames and you would get half of the resolution that the base PS5 would get when playing in fidelity mode. Um there's also another example which is much more simple. It's basically a PlayStation 5 would play the game at 60 frames a second without ray tracing, and a PS5 Pro would play it at 60 FPS with ray tracing. But these feel like d d d difficult situations because, one, I don't think they're that engaging to, to players, and two, that makes them incredibly hard to market when it comes to selling this console. Yes, and I, I think often we talk about the fact that Pro is a moniker that's added to... to um, hardware effectively it, you know that everyone's going to buy it but you just want to kind of differentiate it this actually is maybe one of the rare times that it does feel like it's appealing to a very niche audience people that are really going to say do you know what i i i really need um to squeeze a little bit extra out of it, you know, every single game whereas i think most people probably won't get much from 
from this upgrade it will it'll yeah. become the standard i'm sure like i'm sure it would get to a point where the only thing available to buy is the playstation 5 pro they won't bother doing the playstation 5 um but yeah no I, I i am with you with the idea of who is who is this actually for i don't think it's specifically for anyone is they might as well just call it like I don't even know. Like, give it a different, t- give it a different title to just be like, this is the updated PlayStation Five. Like, this isn't a pro. This isn't an intermediary. This is five point two. Five point two. We've tweaked it. <laughs> we've tw- and going forward, it's the same price, but we've tweaked it. Like, but yeah. Who knows? I, I guess. The, the, yeah, when you want, when you talk about who it's for. There's going to be some people who buy it in day one because it's just that they 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 they're from they gotta have it crowd. You know. Yeah. Um, there's going to be some people who, like you said, it's going to sit on store shelves next to the PlayStation 5, and the people who haven't adopted this current generation of consoles yet, they're going to go into their Walmarts and their Best Buys. They're going to say, well, if I'm spending X amount of hundreds of dollars, I'm going to buy the better one that's on the market at the moment. Like, some people, that they're just that way inclined. Um, you know, when I, when there's multiple iPhone SKUs available at launch, they buy the quote-unquote best one because they feel like that's the... Their brain tells them that's like the better investment somehow. Um, yeah, but I, I, there is another element here, which is that like it's almost like a gaming version of FOMO, which is that that little nagging, gnawing voice in the back of your head that says you're not playing the best possible version of this game that you could be playing. And I sometimes wonder if that works on a case by case basis when it comes to software. If I told you, Jonesy, that you weren't playing the best version of I don't know something you've played. Re- let, let, let's, say, let's say Helldivers, the best looking version of Helldivers. Um, you would be like, okay, great. But if, and I, for example, something like GTA Six was on the horizon, that's you know the easy go to game when it comes to capturing people's attentions and uh, drawing a lot of anticipation. If you were really, really looking forward to GTA Six, and I, 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 in this, you can swap in GTA Six for something you're looking forward to, forward to more. If there is something out there. And a week before release, Digital Foundry dropped a video and were like, yeah, here's here are the benefits of PS5 Pro. And they are perhaps slightly minor. Perhaps it is a minor resolution bump or there is like an unlocked frame rate mode that achieves higher frame rates. Dragon's Dogma 2, for example, has just seemingly launched or is about to launch with an unlocked frame rate. Um, is that is that going to give you... Fo- like, could you see the FOMO from an individual title that you care about massively drawing you to make the move personally these days no like uh, the that used to be the case um i think it's diminished like the diminishing returns of of what hardware can achieve these days with regards to like how the actual difference in how something looks and how something plays the the amount you have to spend in order to get like a noticeable difference even like you're talking PCs and stuff is is a quite a lot, and I don't think you're going to make that much of a difference going from PlayStation to PlayStation Five Pro. Um, I know there will be people out there who are much more you know perfectionist than what they're wanting to play than I am, who I'm sure it will work for. For me, the the real thing would be I'm in that category of people, as you already said. Like if I ha- if I needed a new PlayStation Five, let's say that mine mine so mine recently had some troubles but let's say it actually was was unrecoverable if i went to the sh- if i went out and and walked into a game for example and they had the ps5 pro or the ps5 on sh- a shelf next to each other i would be hard pressed not to pick up the pro um yeah. but i'm not going to run out to play gta 6 like at a slightly higher frame rate or in 1440p at 60 fps rather than 1080 at 30 like it's just not it's not going to move the needle enough for me like just, cause for the yeah. amount of money it's going to be as well like you're probably talking at least like 600 quid or something like that like i, I think yeah for, it, it's just not worth it i think you'd, i'd be sat there going like well that was a waste <laughs> if if i did it for that yeah reason. It, i think that's yeah sometimes the case as well because well again it's kind of like getting a new phone again when these half up consoles because you ps5 the ps5 and the xbox series x at least you took them home and you were like oh my god new console new controller new ui launch titles there will be an element of the ps5 pro that obviously some titles will launch in the same window that take advantage of it but you're just like oh a game that i hadn't played yet looks better than it would have looked on a console that (laughs) i never actually saw it running on and so you never get that like kind of before and after thing you just kind of adapt to things looking better and of course they do make more sense in the long run. I think anyone that held on to a 
baseline PS4, for example, deep into that generation as the Last of Us Part 2s um, and Ghost of Tsushima's of the world were launching, you'd have known because your entire living room would have sounded like a, a <laughs> Boeing 747 was taking off inside of it. Um, the, the, by the end of the generation, we expect the baseline consoles to be pushed to their limits, but it's hard to sell a professional console on that kind of bullet point alone, in the, at least in its infancy. There is one other element here, though, Jonesy, at play, which when you look at the some of the directions that NVIDIA have been going with their graphics cards um, and on the kind of the driver and the tech side as well, is a bit of a no-brainer. And that's, get ready to learn a new acronym, PSSR. Yes. Um, which, for anyone that doesn't know, it's nothing to do with pissing, which is a real shame. I'd, I'd love there to be a piss reference wrapped up in this somewhere. If we could get pissing and dogging in the same podcast... Um, We'd be on to a winner. But instead, it stands for PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution. And I must admit, whilst, again, knocking off points for the lack of piss, I do like the word spectral. Because I don't... What does Good spectral word. actually mean? Uh, isn't spectral... Sort of vi- it just means, like, vision, doesn't it? Like, oh, a, that's way more. I think. See, see, I, I prefer this. If you just Google spectral definition, the first thing that pops up is a definition from Oxford Languages that's a spectral adjective of or like a ghost. Oh, oh, a different kind of... Yeah, that kind of... So, like, so rather the, than spectrum, so, it's going for, like, spectre. Yes, the second definition is of or relating to or made by a spectrum, right. um, which I'm sure is what they're going for because that... As everyone, of course, listening knows, it's relating to or derived derived from the uh, electromagnetic spectrum of visible light. I don't need to go into any details on that because we're all experts already. But I prefer the idea that this is ghostly somehow. That Mark Cerny is being like good out of the power of ghosts. Yeah, like it, it's it's pay, it's PlayStation's new like go literally ghostly super resolution. Like the idea that they came up with a piece of tech that's so bizarre and how effective it is relative to how much power it consumes that like. This is spectral, dude. Like this is fucking ghostly <laughs> shit. It's, see, this is the one thing that, when you actually see it in action, PSS, but the PSSR could be the thing that actually makes everyone think, "Oh, okay, I take it all back." Because if you can, if it does upscale games as it says it can, to like looking like a convincing 4K then yes. suddenly you get to that idea of, "Well, hold on. So can I play a game?" that is running 60 frames a second at 1080, but it's going to make it look like it's running 60 frames a second at 4K, in which case right. I now am in a bit of a weird place because everything I previously said about the PlayStation 5 Pro may be null and void if suddenly you can effectively play a game ray traced 4K, 60 FPS and everything, and it looks fantastic. Like, if you go to a mate's house and he's running something that you've played, as you said, that you've played, and you're like, wow, this looks incredible. Like, what telly have you got? And he's like, oh, no, man, it's the PSSR. And you're like, yes. Knock me down with a feather. Why didn't they lead with this? But then so, I, I, I... <sighs> I agree. Like it, it's, it's never going to be the thing they lead with, but it almost, in some respects, should be when you look at the capacity for what it could do. And like, don't get me wrong. Like, we've all utilized DLSS to to some extent at the moment. Like, and we've all seen the highs and lows of, of DLSS, which is, of course, um, Nvidia's native kind of uh, uh, upscaling technology uh, and super sampling technology. Um, but I don't know if I'd ever call a mate round to say, look at what DLSS is doing for this. The, and maybe that's and maybe that's because oh no, I meant I meant the mate just happens to be there and is like, oh, wow, okay. this looks you're really not, you're nice. Not pulling them around to, to no, get no, no. <laughs> See, if I the, the problem is, I think PSSR. If people start calling it pisser for short, and you, then you're texting a your mate saying, do you want to come around on the weekend to look at my pisser? Um, that's where you could get into get yourself in some real trouble. Also, maybe sounds the right a bit of trouble. Also sounds a bit USSR, doesn't it? Yep. Um, okay, again, yeah, maybe... I'm trying to think of some combination here of, like, my piss... Uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, was, I was just thinking, like, what is, what is the worst-sounding message you could send a friend um, but is actually innocent and refers to, to video games? Like, um, I've, just, I've just got my pisser working, going to go dogging this weekend in the USSR. Um, Want to join by. me? Yeah. Um, I, I have to. Can I? I have to have a take a second to talk about a friend because uh, 
just a guy in chat has super chatted us and i just wanted to give a quick shout out thank you so much oh, uh dropping, legend. The, uh, dropping the 699 super chat there it says haven't caught a live in a while good to see you good to see you too just a guy thank you for the super chat appreciate it great to have you with us very much appreciated um w- but what i was gonna say about uh, dlss and i suppose it's gonna be the same with pssr because you're not gonna get caught in the weeds of it's look it's unlikely you're going to have like multiple pssr options in an options menu in the same way you do with dlss but what dlss does quite well depending on your perspective is it uses like words like balanced and things like it never tells you what it's actually doing it never tells you how low it's dropping the native resolution right and like what the, the amount of work it's doing to kind of like generate the resolution that's desired um but we are seeing uh, games dropping to incredibly low resolutions. I remember there was a lot of furore around, was it Final Fantasy 16 on a, in its performance mode where it was like, oh yeah, if you go through and look at this like natively, it's like 720p or something and people would be like, oh my god, this is a AAA PS5 game. You know, a lot of those gaps will be made up in a far more effective and efficient way than the kind of technology that's being used at the moment. Like, sort of like there are still lots of very rough implementations of like fsr2 and stuff like that out there um so i think that being improved um will help across the board but it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see what the side by sides are i guess is, is the long and short of it when like yes um because when you look you, you mentioned it already that the, when you look at the documentation um they're saying pssr is aiming to deliver similar results and resolution multipliers as nvidia dlss we knew that a game rendering internally at 1080p could be upscaled to a convincing looking 4K image according to developer docs. If you cross that bridge and you actually nail the convincing looking part of that, if 1080p, then then all of a sudden everything's off the table and you go back up to this other part of the document, which sounds like hoodoo voodoo, like black magic shit, where the PS5 Pro is internally aiming for, brace yourselves everyone, 4K 120 frames a second and 8K 60 FPS FPS console gaming, like that's the only way this feasibly works because we're all sat here going, we haven't got 4K 60 yet. When the case of fucking dra- like some releases this week that shall not be named, we haven't even got 4K 30. So like, what the fuck are you talking about? How are you going to quadruple our frame rates or do- like? It's the teraflops, so- Jamie. It's, it's the, the teraflops, teraflops, of course. It's the it, it had to be the teraflops. So I don't know, man. I, I I think even as someone who is committed to getting this day one, regardless of what actually happens, I do still think they have some work to do when it comes to convincing even the most curious of consumers that, that the PS5 Pro feels worthwhile. Um, yeah, no, I I think you're absolutely right. Like. I th- this this is still I think it's still theirs to, to to win. Like I think they can still you know convince a lot of people. But I'm I'm with you at the moment. Like I, I've got a lot of convincing to to add done to me. I I'm not probably going to do this day one. Like no matter what the case is, just from based on what they've said, I could be converted though. Like if a digital foundry video comes out that sort of blows me away and says no, this really is the way to play PlayStation games. Then hey, we'll see. Yeah, we'll also make the well. The non-existent uh, console race, console war, even more interesting is because, again, mm. all the kind of the information we have to go on at the moment is that Xbox have no real interest in going back down the pro or series blank, you know, insert letter of the alphabet here, route uh, this winter at least. Um, so the idea of a PS5 Pro potentially being on the market and being, you know... <sighs> Well, CPU-wise, very similar to everything else on the market, but GPU-wise, in a field of its own, one, that sounds like a bit of a headache for some game developers, depending on the scalability of their games. But two, that also sounds like a very interesting situation for Xbox to find themselves in for what are still going to be the remaining, you know, by the time this releases, three years or so of this console generation, three to four years of this console generation, trying to find a way to de-emphasize as much as possible the fact that they are now... Not only the, not the Xbox Series X, not the most powerful console on the market, but it's not that by quite some margin. Um, I'm sure Phil's all over it, though. Indeed. Um, I just want to give a, a read out a comment from a uh, friend of the show, Robin Reed's audiobooks, uh, just because he said, 8K, hey. 8K 60 FPS, that's nuts. Awesome, but nuts. Like a shatterproof window in a Tesla, <laughs> which, yes, may be an apt uh, comparison because when it actually drops... We'll see if it is as shatterproof as a window in a Tesla, which it may well not yeah. be. 
especially because uh, when you talk about the, the Tesla shatterproof windows, I'm sure all anyone can think of is that on stage demonstration that failed in rather disastrous fashion. Likewise, I think if you challenged maybe even Mark Cerny himself to do an on stage demonstration of almost anything, even fucking <laughs> Roblox running at 8K60. Um, <laughs> Uh, he would he would perhaps struggle. Um, and then even if he got it working, you'd say, congratulations, Mark. You've got this game running at a resolution which no fucking human on planet Earth has a monitor or display or television capable of rendering. I or, hope you're happy or, with yourself. Eyeballs capable of seeing. So, In, in some respects, yes. Uh, we, we will get there. There will inevitably be um, an argument on X like 20 years from now where people go anyone who says they can't see 8k is legally <laughs> blind um yeah uh, because that's the way the internet works did you see that fps thing no i did uh, not there was there was a weird thing where like some people were defending 30 fps and going sometimes i didn't even notice the difference between 30 and 60 and then some other people came in and said if you can't notice the difference between 30 and 60 you must be you must be made legally blind by the U.S. government. You mustn't be allowed to drive. <laughs> That's great. I might have made up a few elements of the argument they're making, but that was the gist of it. I got you. I got you. Any closing thoughts on the PlayStation Five professional, Jonesy? What is it? Not. I mean, not really. But I think we said everything. The only thing that kind of really jumps out at me as like an extra wrinkle to the whole thing is. When we took a price point, you know, we're at the we're at a cost of living crisis, inflation, da 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 da. da. Where is it going to come in? And it does make me think about the fact that they've they've actually just recently stopped the production of PSVR twos because they yes. haven't managed to shift them because there is uh, too much hardware and not enough people buying it. Obviously, that's a, that's a different kettle of fish. It's it's a different bit of hardware, but that is a bit of hardware which is very expensive, but not crazy expensive. You know, like not crazy expensive compared to other VRs in the market. It, and it does make me wonder, is the PS5 Pro going to end up being in a similar area where they've made these units and it's a new bit of hardware, but they just can't shift um, can't shift them fast enough, which will be a very interesting place to be in given that we had the opposite problem with the PlayStation 5 when it originally launched, which is totally. that you could not get hold of them for love nor money. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Yeah, especially when you get into the weeds about like the PSVR 2 <laughs> arguably not selling because... Yeah, you know, there's a lack of distinct lack of compelling software. People are saying, "Well, if I buy my PSVR two, what am I going to use it on?" And then the PS five Pro ends up straddling this middle ground, where the answer in theory is, "Well, anything you can continue to play all the games you would have played otherwise on your yeah. on your PS five Pro." But when the benefits of doing so aren't aren't clear, does it kind of end up? Which line does it end up? Side of the line that straddles does it end up falling down? The PSVR two side of things, where people go. You haven't even been able to make uh, like a, even the first party outlook at the moment. When you look at like the calendar for first party releases, like no one sit like we don't know what to look forward to. We don't know what we're gonna play, play on a PS Five Pro. So yeah, the fact that PSVR Two has found itself in such a sticky situation and the source of the problem could well be said to be software. I think, I think I don't know if it should be of concern to some people at PlayStation, but I'm sure it's on the radar. And there's a part of me that really hopes they're going to kind of pull out all the stops when it comes to the remaining of this calendar year that they've got planned in terms of showcases and and presses and state of plays and all that stuff. Because boy, oh boy, do they need to start getting some people excited about software all over again. Um, but that said, regardless of whether or not they're able to make good on their promises around PlayStation 5 Pro, I know the reason I'm going to stick with my guns and purchase one is because... In a year's time from now, Jonesy, people are going to be listening to this podcast. You and me are going to have an argument, and they're going to say, well, who am I going to believe? The guy that played that video game on a PlayStation 5 Professional or the guy that played it on a PlayStation 5 Amateur? A amateur, that is the thing, is, yeah. I'm going to be still on the Amateur. If I was, you know, if I was on the, um, the PlayStation marketing team, I would genuinely recommend that the base PS5 gets renamed the PS5 <laughs> Am. Um, just... I, I don't know, just to kind of like for real put the really put the nail in the coffin. Imagine, man! Imagine if they that'd be so out of order if they did that. I'm like, I've, I'm, 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 and they send everyone with a PlayStation Five uh, a sticker that you've got a stick on the front of your PlayStation Please, you, that says and, and. Yeah. Yeah. They, they come up with some crazy future technology where the PS Five doesn't turn on unless you put the PS Five <laughs> amateur sticker on it. Yeah, um, be it. I don't know how they do it. If anyone asks how they do it, just tell them, I'll tell them to use spectral technology. Yeah. That's what we've learned today. Um, speaking of spectres, 
ghosts. Uh, they're like ghosts to me because I don't actually know any of them. Uh, they are just usernames that I read out every week. I'm, of course, talking about the wonderful people who support us on Patreon.com. Um, my favorite Spectres, though, it should be noted. Spectres that I have um, a very near and dear place close to my heart, just like my grandmother. May she rest in peace. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, this podcast is made almost entirely possible by the generosity of our fine friends who have gone over to patreon.com forward slash super show and have pledged from as little as $2 a month to keep this show on the road. And uh, we want to say a huge thank you to each and every one of them. Uh, there are some names on screen right now. Look at all those spectres. Aren't those names so spectral? Um, even more spectral are the likes, for example, of Aaron Cameron, Athletic Gravy, Brimstone, Ice Not Rock Salt, Yes, but Cam Dal Nielsen, Pastors Guild. And then, of course, you have the big dogs, the real spectres of the board. Brett Z, a.k.a. Shellshock, Geometric Potter, Haxel Bookread, Manuel Guerrero, and, of course, Peas Ward. Wow. Talk about a ghostly crew. What a, what a spooky bunch of people. Thank you, uh, each and every one of you, and everyone who has ever supported us on Patreon, past, present, and future. Um, for doing so, it is the reason we are still here. That link, once again, it's patreon.com forward slash super show. You'll find all kinds of goodies over there, depending on which tier you subscribe to. Uh, but like I said, $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, whether you want Discord access, whether you want patron exclusive videos, patron exclusive podcasts, all the details are over there. But once again, a huge thank you to everyone who has supported us and continues to do so. Um, it means we get to talk about games, Jancy. It does. Thank, no, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for, su for supporting us. Um, it is amazing. Genuinely, genuinely still surprised that there's anyone still there. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Speaking of surprising, Jonesy, I might be surprised that you've played the game that you're about to talk about, depending on how good at reading or determining acronyms I am uh, based on what you've written in this little document I have in front of us. Would you uh, enlighten myself and the folks at home with what you've got going on? I finally, after like a year of not being able to, managed to play Life is Strange. Um, and the only reason I'm bringing it up... I, 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 I don't, don't, don't you need to quantify. Like, I'm totally here for this. Uh, the only reason I'm even bringing it up is because... Um, is it's a bit of like um, fan service. If anyone had the same issue I had, um, that I was, I'm um, yeah gonna. So I tried to play Life is Strange before, and it's free if you've got PlayStation Plus, you know. Um, so I've I've tried to jump on it before. There's like now three, get four game, however many there are games on there that you can play. Jump in, have a go. And I've I've been calling out for this kind kind of game recently because I've been playing a lot of Hell Divers too, and I was like, I want something a bit different, <laughs> story led. <laughs> downtime Ooh. game very different um yeah very different and i tried to play life is strange a couple of times before and i'd already had this problem that it would never play on my playstation 5 and i was i didn't know what the issue was uh I'd, I'd been online tried to sort it out and it basically every time you launch the game it just immediately crashes could never get into it load of other people online having the same issue finally found out that it's because the playstation allows you obviously as we all know to play games before they've fully downloaded um, it says you can play from this point after like a gig is downloaded, but the game's like 15 gig. So I was hitting play, hopping in, trying to start the game, didn't work. Turns out you just have to let the game fully download. Wait. So every single time you tried and failed to play Life is Strange before, you would just be like, well, that's not working. And like, what well, I guess deleted it before it finished downloading? Yes. You never. I, I, do you know what? I never, I, I, for, I, I think maybe once or twice at the beginning of the generation, but I never, ever launch games at that it's ready to start mark now because it's a lie. It's a con. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. I did not know that. <laughs> I've never had a problem with that before. Um, but no, this was it. And so I finally managed to hop in and play some Life is Strange. And actually, and I've played it for, a, I've, I'm playing Life is Strange 1, obviously, at the first. Uh, played it for a couple of hours. Um, yeah, and, and, and enjoying it so far. Um, I've I didn't realize how much I was missing the kind of Fahrenheit, uh, heavy rain kind of like you know level game that I just want to be able to cruise around, okay. and do some random shit, and make some decisions and have it knock on. Uh, and, and yeah, some, yeah, some fun mechanics. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Uh, I've, I've, I'm in, I'm being called out now in chat because Classy Cat's saying like, he can't believe I'm playing Life is Strange before Bioshock. 
<laughs> which is fair. I mean, um, I d- yes, that's that the reason. I don't want to. I don't want a shooty shooty game. I've been playing a lot of shooty shooty games at the moment, and I'm like, do you know what? I just I want a teenage girl to just like take photos with and 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 hang out and be at high school. So there we go. That's what's well. Happening. Hang on, Joe. You, you got to remember, some people will clip this podcast up. You need to add a clarifying statement there. Do, no, they can clip it. I didn't say I was doing anything untoward with this teenage girl taking photos. Which is taking photos of nice butterflies and uh, and sc- names scratched into trees and stuff. So there we go. Okay. Well, uh, do yeah. you want? Know I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm. I, I, I think fair enough. Like, uh, did, you're right. Every now and then, you do need a break from shooty shooty bang bang. Um, which uh, I didn't mean to sound like chitty chitty bang bang. That's just <laughs> the way that came out. I apologize. Um, and life is strange. For as much as life is strange, mine spoiler alert. For as much as life is strange, one does actually have a gun in it at one point. Um, it does, yeah. Um, it's about as far away from something like Helldivers Two as you could possibly get. And as I, I've, I've vouched for that series a number of times on this podcast before, and I'm, I'm going to stand by it. I think the Life is Strange games are kind of great. And like, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up like some old school like Quantic Dream shit there as well, because yeah, sometimes you do just need to like. I'm kind of playing this game. If by playing you mean walking around, um, <laughs> yeah. but most of this is me having conversations, making decisions, and being sad when people I liked died. Um, which, yeah. I guess, Jonesy, that's what life is all about, right? Walking around, having conversations, being sad when you people the people you like die. That's it. That's life. That's how it, what life is. Yeah. Yeah, and life is indeed strange. Um, I'll be honest, I've got absolutely nothing to contribute when it comes to um, what's going on gaming-wise at the moment, which is extremely distressing um, to me, because if you'd asked me at the beginning of the year, there would have been this sort of perfect, um, you know, excruciatingly detailed calendar of gaming that I had laid out in front of me that would have seen me having started and finished Final Fantasy VII Rebirth already um, in time to start one of Rise of Ronin or Dragon's Dogma 2, likely the latter at this stage. As it is... Um, I haven't even started uh, Rebirth. Um, right. So um, I'm in a bit of a pickle. Uh, I need to work my way out of it. Um, but I but I endeavoured to do so. Uh, it just feels like... It doesn't even necessarily feel like there's a lot going on. Um, it just feels like a lot of them are kind of... Intimi- there's a lot of in- fairly intimidating games coming out at the moment when it comes to the amount of time you might have to commit to them or how long they're going to be on your plate for. Uh, as I've kind of experienced firsthand with... Um, like a dragon infinite wealth which was like right I'm going to take a swing at this and boy you know you, you get some bang for your buck like value for money that, that conversation's off the table but you're also going to be playing that game for the better part of a month <laughs> and when the you know when releases are as hot and heavy as they are at the moment that's that's kind of bad news yeah you're gonna you, you're getting uh it's, it's getting you behind in what's coming out if you're if you're taking a month out to play one thing yes it, it, it's also not helpful that like we talked about the like some back background games like Helldivers Two and Balatro are two of the easiest time sinks that I've played in any year, regardless of the fact that they both came out this year. And I also, I'm not going to uh, elaborate on this or uh, any further because I don't think anyone needs to hear it. But I've also played like ten to fifteen hours of Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain in the past week, <laughs> and I don't, I don't know why. Just needed um, it. Just needed a bit of well, uh, a bit of Metal yeah. Gear. Yeah, there's enough. something about I don't know if it's. Metal Gear games or Kojima games in general, because I don't with Death Stranding as well. But sometimes you're just, you're just like, I'm going to play that game again. Like, I just, do you know what it is? It's actually a little bit sadder than that. It's not even I'm going to play that game again. It's I want to feel those feelings again. Oh, okay, um, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, make um, me, make me feel Kojima. Yeah, let me feel something. Yeah. Exactly. I'm sure. I'm sure there was a quote from somewhere. Actually, no. That that, that was a. Uh, I'm thinking of Roger Ebert, the film critic, when he was like, "Film films are our our machine for empathy." Um, well, for me, it's just replace it with Hideo Kojima video games. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, but the show must go on. Um, Before you do, as- can I ask you? I want to ask you a question because uh, Jim Johnston in the chat. Uh, no, okay. Uh, my my bad. Sixty nine DJ is asked in the chat. Uh, what what gamer snacks are you munching on while you're doing your playing? Is there a go-to gamer oh, snack? Oh God! See, it's I don't know how you feel about this, but it's difficult because some of the things that scream gamer snack may be kind of your know, top shelf ideas, top of the funnel ideas. Um, 
actually are rather inconvenient because of dust and crumbs. Yes. And I've seen people try and come up with, you know, did you ever see that, that thing that someone made where it's like a basically a pair of chopsticks that you operate with your forefinger and, uh, and middle finger? And so no. you can kind of go in and basically hands-free pick up, say, a Dorito and not get any dust on <laughs> your fingers because you're essentially right. using these mini chopsticks that are bound to your first two fingers. Right. I've never in engaged in that kind of tech, that future <laughs> tech, that spectral tech. Um, but I can see the appeal because, yeah, my, a lot of my answers, my go-tos are like inherently greasy, dusty, crumbly things, which is not great. I, do you know what? I don't eat when I'm gaming. It's all. No, like, I know, and I actually get, an, uh, li no, I, literally, I don't. I, I I don't really snack either, so I kind of tend to just, I'll eat, I'll, I'll be gaming, then I'll stop, eat, and then game again. Wow. Like, I don't really do the snacky gamer thing at the same time. And even if I get, like, let's say I grab a couple of biscuits to have a cup of tea, I'll, <laughs> I'll pause the game, eat the biscuits. Oh, it's a bit hard. Okay, I'll eat the biscuits with the tea, then I'll start gaming again, and then I'll drink the tea while I'm gaming. So maybe that's my, my a, a cup of. I'll have a cup of tea. That's about it. So civilized. It you is. really are a British gamer. But let me ask you this then: When you have like an idealized daydream about, and I don't know if you even necessarily. It might be slightly difficult nowadays for you to have these because of family complications. But a, the like a dream gamer day. Like a game that you're really looking forward to has just come out. You've got a day off work. You're home alone. You can stay in in your underwear all day. You have no responsibilities. Is there not some kind of? And maybe you're thinking more about like main meals. You're thinking more about I'm going to order pizza or something like that. But are there snacks involved in that? I, do you know what? I'd probably go like Texas barbecue Pringles and some KFC. I keep it okay. simple. I keep it simple. So you got the crumbs and the grease. You are both. Depending on what, if you eat those things the wrong way around, you could potentially coat your controller in grease and then get it covered in crumbs, which might then stick <laughs> with the grease acting as an adhesive. Um, the worst, the worst combination yeah. of foods. Yeah, yeah, but it's tough. Like one thing that I, I, I guess actually kind of leans into your idea of them being separate acts that one must allow equal amount of times for, uh, time for is the fact that. You kind of can't really eat super well with a controller in your hand. You do sort of have to rest a controller somewhere to eat. Sometimes that's where games with long cutscenes are an advantage. Mm. If, again, if, if anyone was going to replay Metal Gear Solid 4 anytime soon, you could you could have a three-course meal during some of those cutscenes. Get, get your um, snacks ready. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so there's that. But it's I think for me, one of the most important things, and this is something that I... It, it, it's an, an, an inherently unhealthy habit, I guess, but it's almost m like more relevant to me than than gamer snacks is gamer drinks, and like a lot of the times, if I'm, for example, doing an, an all nighter because I'm there for like the midnight launch of a game, which I do do for the games I look forward to the most, as I'll generally play two or three hours of them um, at midnight when they launch, is I need to have an energy drink with me, and of right. course having a quick swig of something. You know, in between gameplay moments during a cutscene, that's far easier. I almost, if if you said GTA Six launch night, would you rather have like a bag of Doritos with you? Uh, if I le let into the meme fully, would you rather have a bag of Doritos with you or a bottle of Mountain Dew with you? I'm going for the Dew, baby. Fair. Yeah, and no, I think I think that's fair. I think I'll, I'll be yeah. with you on that one. And then you're also fueling your gaming, Jonesy, and of course the electrolytes at your bloodstream, your reactions get faster, you're killing people better. Um, these are the kind of technologies that I'd like to exceed, see explored further. Um, and if there were ever ever a place that you wanted to go to see gaming technologies being explored to their fullest potential, especially when it comes to bloodstream electrolytes, then the place to be is GDC, the Game Developers Conference, which is happening right now somewhere in the United States. I don't actually know. I'm going to say Las Vegas, because I'm, uh, but that's just a guess. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I'm going to say... General, somewhere on the in, in or around the west coast of America. Um, how wrong can you be uh, <laughs> with an answer like that? Um, and GDC, Josie, not usually a hotbed for the kind of gaming news that we would pick up on because it does kind of sometimes pertain to various pieces of tech, things that are very early on, and sometimes it's a bit inside baseball, right? It's it's developers often talking to other developers, but things are slightly different this year. We're even just a couple of days into the show um, because we've got. Some topics that have already been breaking, making waves on the internet. Um, one of which 
is doing so courtesy of a game that we have now had a much better look at. Um, and that all took place during a show that Epic put on called The State of Unreal, which, let's be honest, if you kind of looked at what was going on there, a lot of it was just a, a kind of a very broad look at and almost extended advertisement for Unreal Engine 5.4 and all the amazing things they're trying to do, well, and in many cases are doing with that engine. But of course, they clearly saw there was an opportunity there to talk about and perhaps even promote some games that are using that engine. Um, and we got our first proper look at the previously untitled Marvel game from Skydance New Media, which we now know is called Marvel 1943 Rise of Hydra which, as the name would suggest, is set during uh, 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 World War II. I think it's Nazi-occupied Paris in 1943, during which, um, I guess, a Captain America and a version of Black Panther that is I'm presumably not the version of Black Panther that we're familiar with, like it's a, an earlier Black Panther to T'Challa and all that kind of stuff, um, both end up in Paris at the same time. Um, and... While it seems like there's some animosity, maybe a little bit of friction between the two, at first, presumably, they're going to end up working together to kill Nazis and do whatever they can to stop Hitler, um, because he, he's bad and he does bad things. Everyone's um, favourite bad guy. Yeah, I, I guess, Jonesy, like, before we get onto the tech kind of side of things, uh, they did kind of, like I said, they, you know, they unveiled the game in a more elaborate way than we'd seen before, and there was a trailer. on Just purely on the game side, how are you feeling about marvel 1943 how hot are you i I, th I think it's got the potential to be really good um i i you know the 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 game with the dirty name but like marvel's avengers i thought the cap stuff was fun with the shield when you actually got to do some of that in the uh the single player campaign side of it um i think having two melee fake focused uh protagonists is is a great shout um we, you know, with something the uh, Unreal Engine 5.4 like, is, is going to be fantastic, so why not use it to um, render some incredible Parisian scenes while you're kicking the crap out of some Nazis? I mean, yeah, it sounds it sounds good to me. Um, and it does, yeah. it did look incredible, but it's obviously it's far too early to know anything about the game or like how it's going to, how that looks, feels, etc. Apart from the fact that it's going to look fantastic. Um, Yes. But there was one thing that was I was thought was interesting in the trailer was there was a bit where someone says to uh, Black Panther, "Stick to the roofs," and I thought that was a funny. That's probably just a, a bit in the trailer, you know, like "Oh, stick to the roofs" because you want to get caught. But it did give me like old school uh, Spider Man vibes, where it's like they're not going to render the ground, oh. <laughs> so stick to the roof, which I'm sure is not a problem they have in this day and age. Uh, you know, they're not. No. It's not like they're not going to render the ground, but I did think that was funny in the. In but the, the I, I suppose the other the other thing there is like stick to the roofs when you hear that in like video game terms it, like you it almost paints this picture of well now i'm going to be a black panther exploring an open world 1943 paris and maybe sticking to the roofs would be advantageous but my understanding is that this is not going to be an open world game and that's where i guess where this gets interesting when you talk about marvel's avengers you could even talk about you know like a I mean, different comic book franchise but things like suicide squad this appears like it's going to be kind of cut more from the I don't, I don't know, maybe even Arkham Asylum cloth, again, different yeah. different, different comic book, uh, sort of made DC rather than Marvel. Um, but like in, in its linearity, obviously Amy Hennig is involved, but still most famous for helming the original Uncharted trilogy. And she kind of made a point when she was on stage during this of saying like, yeah, this is a linear cinematic action adventure video game. And I don't know if it's because we've, with the exception of, you know, there have been, you know, the Spider-Man games have managed to be uh, cinematic action adventure games while still being open world. Um, you know, Guardian, but, but it takes you take, it take back to something like Guardians of the Galaxy, which was like, okay, cool. We've been kind of being pretty vocal for a little while here about some of the territory we don't need to see superhero games exploring. Um, and now we're actually grateful to get something that feels a little bit more focused, especially considering such a unique setting, such a unique time place, and a, a unique, in theory, kind of like... Um, so like, uh, like the, the the contrast, I guess, between like uh, seeing early versions of these Avengers, kind of like uh, b b perhaps before they're familiar with each other, and like not all sort of like like fucking you know buddy buddy bantering yes. like they are um, in the modern day MCU. Um, I guess does that kind of help uh, move the needle for you a little bit? This idea that this is a linear action adventure game. 
No, no, like that. That's that's what I was, you know, the kind of thing I was anticipating. Um, so, but mm. no, I think I think it looks. It's it's my real issue with it is not is not whether the type of game it's going to be and whether that will make me is is whether it's a, um, uh, whether it's a very flashy, nice looking, linear action game that actually feels like it's on rails. Isn't that fun to play? Um, is a bit too polished or whether it's something that feels really good and plays fantastically. It's like an Arkham or versus, or um, Arkham Asylum, or if it's more like a, uh, what's it called, friggin' 1883 uh, style, like... Oh, I see, The Order 1886. The Order 1886, yeah. sorry, 1883. Uh, yeah, if it's more like that kind of feel, which is the wrong feel... Um, but no, I think this is, this is yeah, this no, to me this this seems and sounds like they're saying and doing all the right things at the moment for this game um which wasn't on my radar at all but now i'm like okay come on marvel you can pull it back let's do this let's have let's have some good marvel games come out this year next year whenever it's dropping you know let's let's have some let's have some fun with it let's let's yeah. move on from the the places we found ourselves and that aren't aren't so good uh yeah so no uh, it, all good yeah. at the moment and, and it looked it, it and it is- looked amazing well, that's the thing. So it is 2025. And it, again, it's kind of interesting to have this conversation after the PS5 Pro conversation, right? Because, again, it looked amazing. And, and it remains to be seen how much of what they've shown uh, so far could be captured by the kind of consoles we will be playing it on by the time it releases. But again, the, the, the promise is lofty. Did you... Oh, oh, this is like a question that's both sort of specific to this showcase, but also how you feel about these kind of things in general. They talked a lot when they were setting up this uh, little presentation about there is no smoke and mirrors. We are pulling. We are pulling this directly out of the game. This is running. You know, it, it, this is running in real time. And they even did the thing where at the very end they intentionally exited full screen so you could see the Unreal Engine UI around the edges. So you could see that it was all running in the engine. They even do a couple of bits where, and it's all completely scripted. By like, but like the camera would be panning along the environment, and Amy Henning would go, "Oh, can you turn off those car headlights for me?" And they, they turn off, and it's like to make okay, a point you, of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, they aren't they aren't lying, obviously, but something can be running in real time on Unreal Engine on a twenty thousand dollar PC. That that's all going <laughs> well. You have to have it running in real time on Unreal Engine five on a five hundred dollar console. In 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 the case of the Xbox Series S, on like a two hundred to two hundred and fifty dollar console. You know, in theory, uh, come twenty twenty five, come next year. So while they say there's no smoke and mirrors how how excited can we let ourselves be around kind of tech showcases like these i i i don't know i i was i don't have a problem with getting excited about these i don't think that that means that this is exactly the game that you're going to get i think but as long as we're starting from a good place i think it's because games are always going to come down right from from where they start and where they are in production they're never going to get better from that obviously that's not possible so i'd much rather they started at the pinnacle and then they got nerfed a little bit to make them playable um so starting from like this this point of which they have these insane um textures and models and all the the uh you know the, the ground and the cars and everything looks fantastic and the ray trace lights look amazing i'd much rather start at that point and then pair it back um yeah and, and like you say, they're going to have some new tech with uh, the PlayStation 5 Pro and stuff's going to be out. Next- Maybe that'll be a great place to play it, as you said. So, yeah, we'll have to I mean, see. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if they come through with Pissa and you, know, you turn <laughs> around and you the, the day someone swings open the office doors at Skydance New Media and says, hey, guys, your game only needs to be natively 1080p, um, then you know, I'd imagine champagne corks start hitting the ceiling. Um, but we'll see. I think... You actually that's actually a very good way of putting it, and now that you've put it that way, I, I tend to agree. Like let's let's push the tech, let's see how far things we can take things, let's let's get amazing looking graphics being rendered in real time, and then you know, let's almost work backwards from there and because that almost ensures you end up with the best looking version of a product imaginable, rather than like setting your targets too low, making a you know, a, a serviceable ver- looking version of something, then, you know, let's say getting it optimized for consoles and saying, actually, we had we had a bit more room before we hit that this, our ceiling here. We could have made this look, to use stupid arbitrary terms, 15% better. And yes. we didn't know because we worked the wrong way around. And now it's too late to make the graphics better. Um, again, using stupid arbitrary terms. Uh, did, did you watch any of the other kind of things that, um, that Epic showed off about Unreal? 
um, after the kind of the Marvel 1943 bit? Did, like, did you see this animation toolkit um, that they're kind of they're pushing? L- literally none of it. <laughs> Okay. I, just, I just watched the bit around that and where the, the guy was moving around with the camera and he was like zooming into the t- I was like wow this is amazing and then I went back to work <laughs> so yeah I didn't okay. see the rest of this I, I, won't, I won't bore anyone with the details but I did think of you at one point because of some conversations we've had in the past where one of the things that they're adding in Unreal Engine 5.4 or anyone that's messed around with Unreal Engine already knows that they have some really cool kind of like almost starter kits where you can download for example they've got like a kind of arena based shooter uh, sample thing yes they've got the um, the city from that uh, matrix awakens demo that you can just download and mess around with but even if you just start a new project in unreal you can start like a third person shooter or a first person shooter project and within seconds I, i've admittedly. done them both there you go and you know <laughs> you'll know as well as anyone that that th- start a third person shooter project you have a a formless but still physical you know 3d character running around a 3d space with a gun in their hand that fires bullets that hits objects and there's physics and so on and so forth yep um they're expanding all of that by adding um an animation tool set that is available to anyone that also is enhanced by you know how you get this um technology i think naughty dog have kind of often been seen as the cutting edge of it where it's not just about having thousands of animations it's about having like that kind of like that deep learning technology that can choose the best possible set of animations to transition to as a character's moving around right. so if a character like suddenly like turn like start was moving forward and then started walking to the left or turn around and stuff like that as seamlessly possible it can say well we're transitioning from this um uh, animation to this animation so we can create the animations in the middle using oh, okay. the, some kind of deep learning tech right so unreal are looking into that kind of stuff and they're putting all of this in the engine for free and i was looking at it and i was you know that conversation we've had in the past about how anyone can make a fake video game that goes viral because <laughs> yeah you just need to boot up the matrix awakens demo swap out the model the player model for a, a, a superman model that someone else made and you've made a superman game yes and then and then you go and then you release that and everyone's like have you seen the amazing new superman game you're like this is pure vaporware there's nothing there this is all yep. but i i've done the opposite like not not the opposite completely but i've booted up that third person uh you know a tutorial level run around yeah. shooting people and been like this is a game like <laughs> this is in the mad it's weird just right give this to you for free and let, and let you there's not much you have to do which kind of makes you think the people that just drop in and model into like the that matrix world you think wow they're doing even less than i'm doing when i'm sat here like tweaking around with this uh this third person shooter level stuff but um, yeah no it's 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 wicked that they give you that access absolutely crazy yeah all i was going to say was basically brace yourself because the amount of like videos we're going to get for incredible looking fake games <laughs> is about to go through the roof i recommend anyone right. go and look at this kind of animation tech because as when you combine it with some of the things that you were talking about already, Jonesy, like how like r- remarkably put together and kind of like ready to go out of the box, some of their things already are in Unreal Engine. Like, yeah, it's going to be a scary, scary time. Um, in a in a good way? Question mark. Um, I think it's harder. Then, it gets yeah. harder and harder to cut through. Um, like it's harder and harder to separate the wheat from the chaff i think because the problem you have is is if a game and we've talked about this before if, if you've got games that are look fantastic on the on the outside um and they even now this is the weird thing is they even feel like they play well um yes. especially especially in chunks like if you had a demo for example you could you could have a game that looks fantastic plays really well and not realize that actually the bare minimum has done of a demo in order to get that game to that point and you could absolutely be forgiven that you're ta- you're looking at a triple a game uh and you can get all excited about it oh when this game comes out but the reality of the situation is the the effort and the time and the expense and all of that that's gone into the actual triple a uh, titles is the things like the script writing the story writing the level design it's all of this stuff behind you know the music uh the um actually doing the motion capture for the for the cutscenes and everything else like there's so much to games that i think it's it's easy to pull the wool over gamers eyes now easier than it's ever yeah. been before ever and i think it's even down to that playability point which is 
yeah, which is is kind of scary, but it's also no, but ooh, it's also cool because whilst that's possible, you've also got people that are just going to sit at home and make their own games. Like we've we've talked on the pod before about you know people that one man bands who will sit and make an entire game all on their own for two years and then release it and it will get critical acclaim. Like I think there'll be more of that and there'll be higher end and people can can visualize the realities of the games that they want to make better than ever before and you're not going to be limited by the fact that you you know you can't afford your own motion rig and to record everything yep. and do your own animations because actually unreal or someone like them have given you a suite of animations that you can utilize they've given you a bunch of um, character models that with a bit of tweaking you know if you want to use a meta human in your game and you want to make it look like a certain person you can do you can do that and they give that to you yeah. for free which is it's it's the most exciting time ever to get into doing stuff and and doing that like but at the same time it's also potentially the the hardest for for players it's it's a weird time it's a weird time man it's a weird yeah, time yeah you got different arguments moving in completely different directions yeah, like precisely. It, it, like the it, the industry's never felt more precarious and money has never been tighter and games have never been more likely to get cancelled but at the same time the barriers to entry have never felt lower and the tools at our disposal have never felt more empowering but i think you're absolutely right it's gonna like we much much the same conversation as people are having about ai at the moment i think we sometimes as consumers and social media users and all these kind of things are going to maybe have to get a little bit better at separating the wheat from the chaff and identifying what's something that someone made you know in 10 minutes and what's something that's got a little bit more substance to it um but if we if we if we kind of all go on that journey together and police that stuff uh in the way that it kind of should be policed then that's um then that will be fine and i i, I think you're, you're right it will be empowering for kind of like individual developers for for small teams i think it's also going to be a really strong um kind of breeding ground for proof of concept things people who are like yep. i've got this really idea you or you uni- really unique idea for a world or a mechanic or a like a, whatever it is the idea of being able to get very basic like demos of things up and running quicker than ever and looking smarter and more polished than ever before so that now, you know, when you're trying to showcase something to, you know, potential investors, let's say, rather than it being like, you know, boxes and rectangles that you're trying to say, imagine that's a character, like maybe some of those, some of those stepping stones are now jumped over in a way that may be beneficial to those pitches, maybe helps see, you know, investors or directors, you know, see the vision for things earlier or in a clearer fashion, whatever the case may be, you know, I think broadly speaking, that the, the Unreal are doing as much as they're doing, that Epic, excuse me, are doing as much as they're doing, giving as much of it out for free as they are, and still you know maintaining, and in some cases even improving the terms for developers um, is, is great. There is one minor correction though, Jonesy. Oh, you at a point. Oh no, I was I was going to say I know this is kind of a, a very me thing to think and it's a bit stupid but I watched the trailer for uh, Aliens Romulus yesterday um and they've kind of gone back to that aesthetic you know a similar a old school alien aesthetic you know not too flashy but definitely like realistic looking spaceships and stuff and I, I look very cool and um, after having like, having only recently watched Unreal and like what they were doing I must admit it did a, it did make me think blimey if these days, like if I was back doing film like I did at university, you know, 20 years ago, you could actually make a really legit uh, like sci-fi film yeah. or something using free elements of Unreal to create a ship model in space that looked effectively on par with, with some films looking very yeah. good with like the right lighting and stuff. Go on. Yeah. I was going to say, didn't the backgrounds that they, or the, 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 the environments that they ran in real time on the volume on shows like The Mandalorian, they were all unreal, right? Oh, I, not, that's amazing. I've no idea, but that's great. I, that, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. See, and th- then you think like the ability for you to, not only with video games, but also with like animation, with movies and things, is kind of crazy. I mean, you've, you then have to cross the bridge of saying, okay, can I add if you wanted to do something yourself like that and you know okay i'm gonna make a short film or something you've then got to get some people who can act and you've got to get a decent camera to shoot some stuff but it's still pretty yeah. impressive that you can uh you can put together something that and high le- end. Unless, again unless you do it all, all of that like digitally as well and then like you're getting these yeah. weird things where like you can i think there are apps that let you capture your facial performance um using your iphone's camera and like right. relay that information there are also like 
Um, I know there are apps, for example, for scanning. You can do like 3D scans yes. on your iPhone, send that information to your PC, go into Blender, clean it up, up a little bit. You can bring those models into MetaHumans to create realistic MetaHumans based on you know, so your own true, scan. Yeah. You can then, for performance, yeah, there are one-to-one -one apps where you can give a performance. Even if you get, again, you don't have a green screen or you don't have mocap suits or any of that stuff, you can just like capture performances and it can try and interpret it's not perfect but it can try and interpret that data and before you know it you can have like lifelike digital models of of yourself or, or or whoever you wanted to make you can actually have performative elements taking place you have you can put them in the, the city from the matrix awakens with cars going past them and yeah you can like the, so, these suddenly are all you've, you've suddenly made yeah. a short film that looks better than the matrix and it's well, uh, yeah during the, the during the state of Unreal thing, they um had a, they had an interview with I think the guy's name is Greg Fraser, but he's a director of photography who's just shot the two uh, June movies. Yeah, um, that is one thing I I should say actually that I've done since the last podcast. Uh, surprise, surprise, June two is good. Everyone else has told you that already, so you don't need me to tell you. Um, but he was he was kind of did an interview, and of course it was an interview for Epic at the State of Unreal event. So of course it was all you know. Uh, pointed that in that direction but like he was saying like that, that that he thinks there's going to be more and more crossover in the future in terms of video game people working on the mo on the film um, production side and perhaps vice versa because technology like unreal engine is just going to become more and more relevant and pertinent to the kind of things that are happening in the film industry whether it's the creation of environments to be used like in traditional visual effects pipelines whether it's uh, the creation of assets to be used in real time with technology alongside technology like the volume where again they're you know they're using kind of like essentially ar rig cameras in in unison with unreal engine and, and so on and so forth like yeah and, and again you like you you look at what you you look at you go back to marvel 1943 and you're like yeah if like that's the quality of Sometimes those things are only as striking as they are because traditional animated major motion pictures haven't gone for um, human likenesses uh, as, as a goal for a long time. Perhaps out of fear for the uncanny, uh, like wandering into the uncanny valley, yeah. which was something that Chris, when we were chatting to him in midweek, pointed out about Marvel 1943. But it's a stark reminder that like, like even just like... like or the, the video game side is getting really fucking good at doing things that were for a long time the domain of the film industry. It it definitely is. And and you know, not to like uh not to foreshadow anything, but you then get to the point where imagine you then combine LLMs and LAMs and you suddenly yeah. have an Unreal where you can say to it, like, Hi, Unreal. I would like you to have a cat, this character walk into this environment, do this, use this model that I've just downloaded from this place, use this background. I want this character to do to run into a room and then and and suddenly you you can do everything like with um you know the passive vo you know uh, the like a normal speaking voice and just tell it what you want it to do and it's gonna yeah. pull it all oh, that's it's it's a weird world, man. It's a before weird you know world. it. Before you know it, the only thing you're missing is a little bit of narrative development, and so you get on the blower to the friends over at Sweet Baby Inc. and you got yourself a smash <laughs> video game. Don't, because you know you know that I want to buy it, and I don't know anything about it. I'm, I need to okay. I need to look up more and learn more about GamerGate 2.0. You know what, Jonesy, that is a very measured response. Um, for you and I, and I appreciate it um, and I'm sure there are plenty of people listening and watching at home who are also grateful for the fact that we're going to move swiftly on um, to another GDC headline which is actually, actually maybe they won't be grateful because this is probably going to piss some people off a little bit in its own right but maybe Jonesy maybe you could just explain to people why perhaps it shouldn't piss some people off as much as it, don't get me wrong our listeners and viewers are far more measured and level-headed than perhaps some of the more reactionary folks you might find on social media platforms out there. Um, but we're going to be talking about AI and the potential for AI-powered game characters and NPCs, courtesy of the finest game developers on the planet, <laughs> the most popular, to, who haven't had a viral video made about them inside the past week. And that's Ubisoft, um, because they were out at GDC this past week. Uh, which I've now learned is in San Francisco, which kind of means my West Coast guess was was accurate. Uh, they unveiled Neo NPCs, Jonesy, which, much like pisser and dogging, means nothing to certain people, but might mean something to others in the future. 
Uh, yes, I think we've we've effectively talked about this before, saying that this was a thing that was was obviously coming, um, and it was it was purely a matter of time. But um, it's it's really cool to actually see it being implemented. And I, I say really cool. I know some people won't like that, but like, yeah, on to give you a rough outline of what a neo NPC is. So if you've used ChatGPT, if you've used any of those like LLM models, um, you'll know that you can effectively have some. Um, you, you can almost create your own GPT, right? So on ChatGPT, you can say, "I want to, I want to, uh, I want to." What's the blimey? What's the word? I want to sort of script my own GPT that has a certain way of responding. I don't just want it to have the standard response. I want it to be like this. I want it to have this personality. I want it to act like this. And so what Ubisoft have done is effectively use writers to create um, neo NPCs that, whilst they're using AI and they're using LLMs and and uh, generative. Uh, you know, language models and to understand what you're saying, they're creating these NPCs that are written by human writers. Um, they have backstories, they have characters, um, but then they almost, they can interact with you as if they were um, autonomous and as if they as if they were just computers talking to you, which is so freaking cool, man. Like, I, this is what I was hoping, the sort of thing I was hoping. Like, you can't have a completely free LLM that can just do whatever it wants because you'd end up with a bunch of boring, generic, uh, NPCs that are all going to sound the same, look the same, whatever. But with a human, yeah. this is, I've always thought this: if you put humans and AI together, you are going to get the best of you know a creative endeavor. So you've got writers who are writing interesting, um, engaging characters, and then letting the LLM speak for them on the fly, effectively in game, which is what uh, Ubisoft have been showing off with these um, neo NPCs. Yeah, it, it, I think very well put. Like I, I was at um, an event last year um and it was actually an event that was mostly about sort of like filmmaking and animation but it had um a Q&A segment at the end of all of these talks that were given by people from various companies like there were people there from from ILM and from Framestore and you know companies like that um and unsurprisingly a lot of the cues in the Q&A uh veered at some point or another towards AI and almost all of them, and we were talking about some of the you know the biggest creatives um, uh, working on the visual effects side of the film industry at the moment. Almost all of them had the same take, which was that you know it's not about being scared of AI or put you know pushing AI away. It's all about understanding that AI is always going to be utilized at its best when it's done in unison with a creator and with someone who is still very much steering the ship. And that is obviously what. Ubisoft in this case are putting the emphasis on which is sensible not just because I think we all agree it's the best the way to get the best out of the technology but it also is a slightly better look than just saying oh yeah we're handing the reins over to AI because obviously there's a huge amount of fear and hysteria at the moment around the potential for AI to kind of almost replace certain humans in the pipeline and the idea that a company like Ubisoft might want to replace its narrative department with a bunch of robots let's call them who just spew out whatever it is um and so the human touch being a part of the process i think is is vital in many respects I, and I, there's a part of me that almost just wants to i don't know how far away this technology kind of is and when they're going to begin to try and implement it and how how it's going to look in, in in its infancy but there's a part of me that finds it hard not to kind of look at this stuff and take it as far as it could potentially go and I mean, we want to. You want to talk about kind of um, like a, a narrative immersion, and you want to talk about like immer you know, immersive gameplay and some of the things that people were pra praising um, games like Baldur's Gate three for last year. Like, yes, it's very admirable when a team of people work on that for years and write millions and millions of words of dialogue. But the idea that we're, like we're potentially looking in a future where games like that are a lot more accessible but not just not more, a lot more accessible you create a world where it's like it's not even that there are so many words on lines of dialogue that have been written you don't know what you're going to get it's like literally things are being almost written for you on the fly based on maybe decisions you've made and get like we've been chasing that pot of gold at the, at the end of that rainbow for so long this does feel like it has the potential to kind of open up whole new doors in that chase for like complete narrative immersion narrative surprises and like that the idea of like emergent narrative gameplay yeah I, I think no i think you nailed it like for me i think the way to look at this is not to think that you're going to end up with a, a, a broad 
LLM, like ChatGPT, writing the dialogue for NPCs. That would be that would be rubbish. Anyone who's had any time with the, with a ChatGPT style system knows that you're gonna it's gonna not be very good. I think the way to look at this is to say rather than the writers of something like Baldur's Gate having to write millions of lines of dialogue, what they and and then record it effectively, what they'll be able to do is to have a lexicon which is the you know the words that the characters will use right this is the words that we the kind of words we want our characters to use which is thousands and thousands of words but then you're going to have writers effectively writing the character um and it's sat from what they've said it sounds like so they'll they'll write the backstory they'll write how you know the how the character interacts they'll write the type of character they are they will then constantly improve upon that when it's the uh, LLM then generates the language they'll constantly tweak and improve the language and make sure it sounds like the character so effectively what the writer's doing rather than writing the dialogue from their own head they're going to write the character and then the LLM will write the dialogue which to me is like yeah that sounds like a fantastic way to put those two things together like if you can if you can write a character who was sound, they're not, but they sound like they're living and breathing and they can use every word in the English language, but you've yeah. specifically tailored the character, then when I walk into a shop in a game and in GTA and then hold them up and, I, and the character just has a little bit more uh, a little bit more to play with rather than always dropping the same lines you know every time if you go in and start shooting you know that in, in GTA the thing where you, like you start shooting around the head of the of the cashier to try and make them speed up you know like yes just little things like that if the if the person behind the till can actually have a, a, a meaningful dialogue with you that reflects what you're doing it just, I think it just adds flair that's all it's doing is adding flair um, I don't think we should be scared of it I think we should be excited about it um, I think it's it's gonna be interest it's gonna be weird when people start to get too into npcs and games and you'll start to get people just talking about a specific npc that they're like in love with or something but yeah but, but then people do that already <laughs> people fall in love with so npcs true. extremely readily <laughs> I, I think it, it's gonna be weird like when you look at exactly how ubisoft uh showed off this tech at gdc like there are some weird elements where from what i understand uh the people who entered into these demos were actually like t talking to these npcs they were using um, voice right which is which is interesting i, w I didn't expect it to go yeah. that, that quickly but yeah because because then because then you're getting into this whole new kind of that like you're getting down a weird rabbit hole of like let's say um it's her isn't it we're getting to her that's where we're nearly at the scar the the scar to, I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm also <laughs> trying to like hone in on your uh your shopkeeper example right and like, like you're you're right. We're so used to having such limited options. To uh, okay, I, I must. Have, I, I apologize. I was getting so distracted. Um, if I've looked like like slightly off for any of the last two minutes, it's because Jonesy. I thought I thought you were having a, a family nightmare. Um, but because I I could hear like a child screaming and then a woman's voice soothing this child and I was like oh god something's going on in Josie's but you know he's soldiering on and like fair play maybe he doesn't know his mic is picking it up but I'm not going to distract him and I was like why is it still going on why isn't Jonesy like muting his mic when he's not talking and why don't I recognize that person's voice it turns out I had a tab <laughs> on a window that has decided to start playing halfway through the podcast that is, it's a Reddit post from the r slash interesting as fuck subreddit that says, beautiful moment when two-year-old Nicoli Pereira, who was blind since birth, sees for the first time. And I have just listened to one minute, 26 seconds of it <laughs> in the background, being uh, th thinking it was going on in your house. So I apologize. No worries. Um, but yeah, like, when you think about that shopkeeper example, like, as I was saying, we're so used to not having any agency in that situation whatsoever, other than, like you said, like, maybe you can shoot around the head to maybe scare them a little bit more. But now you can engage with them. And, like, Give me the cash. Give but me it's the money. Almost, but it's almost like, what if they, what if they, like, what if they started, like, begging for their lives? And then what if you started talking? And then before you know it, like, what if you're oh, having, like, wow. a two-hour long conversation with the shopkeeper about, like, their family and the reasons they've got to live and why you don't want to kill them? or how, like, And it's just, like, it creates this weird rabbit hole where, like, do you, do you potentially open up the funnel too much if every NPC <laughs> in a game is a new NPC and you could stop on the street and be like, like, hey, let's... You, uh, I, I, well, I hadn't thought two, about two wow I hadn't thought about that that's a bit that's weird that's very and the, strange 
and, and w which does, as you say, open up the kind of some her-like uh, possibilities of people very much falling in love with it, new NPCs. The other thing that I'm worried about is sometimes the creation of a character. Uh, from what I understand, neither of us are, are, are writers in the in this sense. But for when you talk to writers or listen to writers, sometimes it's like the creation of a character and that character's like fundamental you know, qualities and personality attributes and stuff like that is as important as what they say. It's like, um, you know, what, like what, what they look like, their background, like I said, the personality, the various attributes and so on and so forth. Are, are there going to be writers out there who almost don't want to give their creations over to this kind of technology out of fear of like, once you open up this Pandora's box of, you're going to create a character and you, you, know, you can define as many elements of that character's personality and things they're likely or unlikely to say as possible. But at the end of the day, you're still giving them over to a, to a t technology that could see them literally say anything. And all of a sudden you're on Twitter as a developer going, watching clips and you're going, oh my God, that character would never say that. They would never do. It. And you're like, and of course the argument would be, well, you've got to teach the model and so on and so forth. But there's still an element of like, how do you, basically in both, both these questions tap into the same thing, which is that do you at, at some point actually have to restrict the, 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 the broadest capabilities of technology like this? Otherwise, video games just start running away with themselves and lose all focus. I, I think you do. I think you do have to massively restrict it because, like you said, you, you don't want to get into an existential conversation with an with an NPC shopkeeper who uh, right. you, you just want to hold them up and then they start telling you, like, please don't shoot me more. Please don't take my money. I've got to put my kid through college. Like, uh, I think it gets into a dicey territory. Also, I think you don't want to get into a position whereby you've got people sat at home with headsets on yelling, give me the money or I'll shoot you. <laughs> and then, you know, it's going to get a bit weird if, if people right. overhear that. Um, but no, I, I think, yeah, you do, you raise an interesting point because up to now, um, a lot of the, a lot of the big, uh, powerful LLMs, especially have got a lot of constraints on them because right. um, probably for the simple fact that when companies have messed around with, um, uh, with um, AI before, especially AI language models, they've let them learn on the fly on the internet and you've ended up with, you know, a lot of the toxicity on the internet seeps into the AI pretty fast. And they've had to, you know, all examples I think have effectively had to close down. But if you want a character who is edgy, dicey, especially right. if they're an antagonist in a video game and you're going to use a Neo NPC, you have to give them the ability to say some pretty heinous stuff. Like, I'm thinking Far Cry games specifically. Well, this, right? yeah, we're talking about Ubisoft. It, precisely. Like, I'm and thinking. So, like, what about an, a Neo NPC Vars? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly where my mind was going. Or even no, even Far Cry, Far Cry Six, like the most recent one, right? You've got the I can't remember the name of the guy. Uh, the act, the, the actor plays him. Oh, yeah, uh, I can't remember the, I can't oh remember my name. god, he's in, uh, how have I forgotten his name? Gustavo Fring. But they, so, if you have something like that. If they, if that in the future was like a neo NPC, let's say you use the voice of that actor, Giancarlo Esposito. There you go. Thank you. You're gonna end. You're gonna have him. Let's let's say he did the old thing where he gave his voice over to Ubisoft to allow them to utilize his voice. You could end up with him saying some, hearing himself say some really crazy stuff on because he's like yeah. a dictator, like a despotic dictator with who steals kids and kills people and all sorts of crazy stuff. So you can't have him be constrained in what he can say. He's going to say the most crazy, crazy shit. But like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that is going to be interesting. But then maybe that leads to some. Oh, I can't even think. Like maybe the way they do it is like they say, okay, we're going to utilize. We want this guy to be really bad. He's going to be Nazi esque. Therefore, we're going to teach him on the the writings of like. We're going to teach him like Mein Kampf. We're going to teach him um, uh, like Nietzsche. Nietzsche stuff. We're going to teach him like, uh, you know, all this weird, we just take all this weird learnings and we're going to pump them onto a character and see what comes out is what I'm sort of getting at. You don't then want to constrain it too much because you want it to have the ability to to see where that goes. But yeah, I'm with you that you don't really want your YouTube clips of your, of your uh, character professing some sort of weird ideology right. like, through your game. Yeah, you get Especially when it's not in service of of a narrative, because no. for as much as like, because at the end of the day, these NPCs are always going to be th the things that populate and kind of like line the walls of a story that has to have a flow to it and has to be paced correctly yeah. and has to have a meaningful, like 
you know beginning middle and end and while there are some of these elements that i'm sure could enhance like say the relationships you have with companions uh, along that journey or the the kind of the animosity you feel like the uh, harbor towards um a, a, an antagonist like you again you have to kind of like you have to kind of like tighten it up at some point you have to be able to package it in such a way where like no, this is still a story that's worth playing like at some point you know, a rabbit hole can get too deep um, to the point true. where, like, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. And, in GTA but, Six, you're going to be having conversations with the strippers in the in the in the um, uh, the private lounge, and they're going to be like, "I don't like my job. I don't want to be here." And you're going to start yeah. to feel bad. Oh, good, like, yeah, exactly. Oh, like GTA Six could open up a whole kettle of fish again, depending on how th- those characters are handled. And then you get into other weird things like comedy, which is that like. To, like what if there are early versions of these like language models that aren't maybe great at figuring what what's funny and why because <laughs> right you know they, that's a very you know human thing and all of a sudden they're telling like jokes that just don't work or that and you're like what is wh- why why am i doing like again we, we talk about like infant like a dragon infant wealth we talk about final fantasy 7 rebirth we talk about dragon's dogma 2 and maybe even Rise of the Road. Like, we're not playing games in the year 2024 and saying, do you know what these games need? More words. Um, <laughs> no. We are sometimes like, and don't get me wrong, it is d- delightful when when you're entertained by the directions that conversations can take. Like, the reason I often go back to and replay either all of or parts of Disco Elysium, which I, and I understand for some people, Baldur's Gate 3 would be a better fit here, but I'm more of a DE guy, so that's what I go to, is because sometimes I, I love seeing like the dialogue options I have at my disposal and wh- the crazy di- directions that conversations go in when I choose them. And sometimes like I like right, role-playing pl- role is all the different variations of that character that you can end up role-playing in because... Like, they, they, because much like I'm sure Larian did, um, yeah, Zam like thought of so many different like ways of responding to the kind of things that you can do, and like when a game developer has thought of a, it looks like they've gone into I think it was someone from Larian might have been even been sort of like the head of who was like when you've shine a shine a light on even like the darkest of corners that you know that's when you've kind of really created an immersive world, so that the what even if that one player finds that dark corner when they do something that they, they're used to games not responding to and the game responds to it that's what creates those like truly memorable moments right um and i, I I'm, I'm excited for the capacity that this technology has to enable more of those moments like the unexpected responses the unexpected consequences of your actions and things like that the shit that makes you go oh my god i did this and the game did that but that almost feels more powerful when it's authored it hits home. It rings true a little bit more when you're like, someone at that company what knew that a fucking freak like me would say this or do that or try this, and they and that they 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 spoke back to me. And One, I, know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't I don't I don't know if it loses all meaning when everything is that. I, I totally agree. I, I think one of the things that one of the games that really jumps out to, to me that when you say that is um for in like the Stanley Parable, the first time you stand in the broom cupboard. And just be oh, like, haha, yeah. game, I've tricked you. And then the voiceover says, like, he was standing in the broom cupboard wondering why he was still in there. And you're like, oh my, it knew I was gonna do that. But yeah, you're right. If the if the game knows what you're doing because it can interact with you, then suddenly that loses it loses some of the relationship between the writer and, and the player. Um because yeah. it's it's watching you in real time. Whereas you know when there's in the Stanley parable that they just guessed something you might do when you played the game. Um but but I, I think the benefits of it are going to outweigh the loss of those moments of connection between the writer and the player. Just because I think for all of those um, those few moments we do have in games, there are many more where we're like constantly bashing up against invisible walls that, or, or immersion breakers, where we're like, oh yeah, this isn't this yeah. is just a game. To actually have a character who interacts with you in a meaningful way i think would be pretty amazing i i think for, we were saying about how would they stop it from getting away from them i think the, the the easiest way is to just simply not allow most characters to have voice uh voice to voice interaction like if in in gta if you couldn't talk to 95 percent of the npcs and even if they were neo npcs that responded to what you did at least you couldn't tr- talk to them and have them react to you in a you know in a specific way yeah 
Um, or maybe you, you do like a weird thing where like the dialogue the dialogue options you have, for example, are set in stone. Yeah. The thing that isn't set in stone are the responses. Right. And the responses could then be crafted based on all kinds of other information that's available to the model. So like the number of people you've killed or the number of the right. times you've done this, the number of times you've done that. All of these are variables that determine the nature of the response. But the questions that you can ask for the sake of you know uh, simplicity might all be the same like five conversation prompts the answers that you just might get might be radically different where like you know you can you can ask every npc like how was your day or you can ask all these right. npcs how was your day but you might come on the podcast and say yeah like i got a super generic answer and i might go like they went on a 10 minute rant because i killed their husband five minutes earlier <laughs> how do you think my day was you just shut my heart yeah that that yeah. for me is that's where it will shine yeah i don't necessarily need every npc to me to be able to talk to them as, as ubisoft was showing off like i don't want to i don't want to go into certain elements I, like in an assassin's creed game i don't want to be walking through a crowd and be like excuse me and they're like oh you're so rude and then you're like oh, am i being rude and like yeah you keep pushing yeah. past me and then i'm like oh maybe i won't maybe i won't push past people anymore in, in an assassin's creed game i agree like that would be too unless much. that too that new npc is voiced by scarlett johansson and i can keep them yeah. on a convenient portable device in my breast pocket um with my mustache and my glasses and uh, flirt with them for hours on end. In which case, I might be a little bit more down for I, the neo NPCs. I think I think there will. I think neo NPCs themselves, with these crafted personalities, will become a fad in their own right. If if it does work as well as like what they've said they're trying to do, because like we said, there's there's a lot of uh, restrictions on LLMs currently, and and what they are allowed to say, and what the companies who make them will allow them to say. I know there's some looser looser. Um, constraints on ones you can pay for to download into your mobile phones apparently sure. um yeah but i can i can see people going into games and just chatting to npcs that they can for ages if they particularly like a certain person oh, yeah. if, it, if it's there that are, good yeah there are probably already people who use chat gpt or or, or or equivalents as a replacement for conversations with real people like people who yeah. are like lonely or bored and they're just like i'm going to talk to chat gpt uh, that's probably a thing that happens um and when it comes to the video game elements here like it, it's a it's a reality we're gonna have to face there was a new survey conducted by engine maker unity quite recently um that revealed that almost two-thirds of game development studios are already using artificial intelligence in their workflows obviously you know we we if you go on social media you've seen um, many conversations about art, but of course, uh, in the previous podcast, we've talked about voice acting. Um, you know, we've uh, artificial intelligence's potential impact on music has been discussed in the past. Um, coding, you... programming, again, like there's two people who have both used ChatGPT yeah. to help with After Effects expressions. Like, you know, that that's it's it's it's, it's an inevitability. I, I was going to say we we use it on the podcast sometimes for different different elements like we'd have to say yep. that we've used it i use it at work uh for for, for stuff um for uh, photoshop generative stuff i've i use so it's, yeah. I, it's I, still... i'm not surprised that i mean i was gonna say two-thirds that's amazing but then i'm like no because it's it's kind of ubiquitous already in different programs so at some point in your workflow you probably are gonna use it oh if you if you use google docs then you're like i mean i i'm looking at a google doc right now and i have prompts saying help me write you know <laughs> right yeah yeah of course like that's uh, every like, word processors now have it like my my laptop updated recently to have a little um, ai kind of like os level companion in wow. the bottom right i don't know why my work pc hasn't pa paper clip is back <laughs> the paper clip is back in, in many respects and so yeah like some people are probably using ai uh, in ways that they hadn't even intended, and of course, there's other. There's also the element of like, you know, money's important, and money comes from oftentimes people who um, know what they know what they want, but don't know why they want it, or who don't know a huge. And like sometimes speaking to directors or investors or venture capitalists and saying, "Oh yeah, of course, we're on the cutting edge of all this AI shit. You know nothing about, but I've heard heard a lot about." Probably sounds good. Um, it, an area that you need to be at least seem to be exploring um, to remain as relevant and as future-proof as possible um, in what is, at the moment, a pretty cutthroat industry. Um, you know what else is a cutthroat industry, Jonesy? What's that? 
podcasting. The podcast game is a tough one. And to remain relevant, you have to continue to produce high-quality podcasts on a regular basis, which is exactly why we haven't been relevant since 2017. <laughs> but still... Here we are. I, do you know um, what I, you made me think then? I was just suddenly thinking, I wonder if there's enough material out there of us podcasting that someone could utilise an AI to produce a podcast of us where we actually I mean, were not involved at all. Even Scary if you just thought. look at the Super Show and ignore you know predecessor uh, channels, there's at least 200 episodes that probably average out at 19 to two hours. Let's say they average at, they probably don't average out at two hours, but let's say they did. So you've got 400 hours of just oh, two God. to three people talking. There are, there are li obviously live stream archives from, from we could this bring channel. Chris back. Individual Twitches. We could bring a virtual. I mean, we've joked before about soundboards, but of course this is just the next <laughs> the logical evolution of maybe, that. Maybe we um, try and bring virtual Chris back. We'll try and do an AI virtual Chris at one point and he'll be horrified when he listens back oh, yeah. to it and he hears himself. Because we, we, we have, we, if we, I don't know if I've got them on a drive anywhere, but back in, especially back in the days when, uh, before we kind of uh, just basically streamed one person's perspective, we used to record all our own audio individually. We did. So yeah. there are audio tracks out there that would just be Chris's mic. For, like, <laughs> so yeah, if we fed all of that into something, we'd probably get a pretty good result out the back end. And and then um, we use an LLM to and we feed it in with the script. We we translate to all the scripts that he said. Feed that into the LLM so it can anticipate what he's going to say, and then we use the AI voice generator to then actually say it and then we can do it there we go we can we can bring chris back artificially oh, th th there you go that's 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 one of the targets we've got for the year of 2024 so and maybe we'll make that a stretch goal on on patreon that if, if people pledge enough money we will bring back a virtual version of chris well um, we need, it would have to be like 100 grand or so we need to hire like a, a, a pro, someone who can do that with uh, all the different areas of artificial reality so it's a pretty lofty goal but yeah we'll I mean, see they're called we'll stretch see. goals for a reason jonesy and uh, you know what <laughs> Who's to determine how much of a stretch it really is? There may well be. You know, the, every podcaster's dream is that even if like you get to the point where 15 people are listening to you, it only takes one of those 15 people to be a billionaire, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you're laughing. Elon's listening. I, do you know what? I, I, I was going to make a joke about how, how I, I wouldn't get into bed with Elon, but I, you know what? I think I'd only have to see the money... Be like it would only have to as soon as it became real, I wouldn't be able to say no. It's like that classic thing of like, would you do blank for like ten thousand dollars? And people, it's not real, so people go, oh no, of course not. But as soon as you showed them a briefcase, you're like, here's ten thousand dollars, pick it up and walk away with it. They're like, well, actually, that's like a, you know a, a third of my annual salary, and I would be crazy not to because this could do this for me or that for me, and yeah. I could pay off this or buy that. Um, which is our way of saying Elon. Um, I have questions, I have concerns, but I do love that green. <laughs> um, not yeah, those are dollars. Not that's not a marijuana reference. For anyone. I don't do drugs. Jonesy, thank you for joining me this week. Uh, what a humdinger of a podcast! You've been a superstar. Thank you for being you. Thank you, mate. Thank you for uh, for hosting for uh, taking the lead on this one. An absolute pleasure, and a thank you to everyone out there for watching and or listening to this podcast. Um, and hey, if you get down and dirty with any adventures in the worlds of dogging or pissing or any of the fun stuff we've talked about in this uh, past couple of hours, then do let us know. You can chime in in the comment section on YouTube, you can reach out to us on Twitter, you can do all that good stuff. And if you want to see more of these episodes in the future, then the way you can support us is by going to patreon.com forward slash super show. But that's it for this week. We say thank you for joining us and a reminder that you can catch us again, not necessarily same place, same time next week, because this was a one-off, presumably one-off Thursday episode. We're usually being beamed out and broadcast on Tuesdays. So stay tuned for that next week. And with any luck, we'll see you then.